worship and to praise and to sing and to see what God has for you. Uh, I just have a few personal quick announcements this morning. While I'm doing so, if you'll take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of John, right after the book of Luke. January 6th, we are going to try our best to have a men's breakfast. So if you'd like to be there and be involved, please see me. I'd like to get a list of guys together who are going to be there. Also today after church, we're going to have a quick choir practice just for Christmas morning. Uh, if you'd like to sing, it doesn't matter how well you sing or how bad you sing, we're singing for the glory of God, not to appease or please people. So please come and be a part of that. We're going to practice for about five, ten minutes. Um, also, if you have the opportunity to be able to serve or want to serve in the nursery, right now, right now at the very moment, there are about nine or ten kids back there. Um, so it's growing rapidly. Um, so if you can, and if you're able to, please uh, see Miss Evelyn, as she's created a list, and we'd love for you to have, be a help of that. Also, if you'd like to do stuff around the church, right now, uh, Brother Ron, his wife, Miss Evelyn, I would like to thank them personally for decorating. They've done such a marvelous job. You look at the tree and everything that you see. Please, uh, if you can, make sure you say thank you to them because they're doing so much. But if you'd like to get involved in some way or somehow to do something at the church, please come see me. Because the, as the Bible says, right, that the, the harvest fields are plenteous, but the laborers are few. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, we can, I promise you we can find something to do if it be so simple. And saying that, we are looking for someone to help clean the church. Uh, right now, if we can clean it once a week, maybe once every two weeks, if you'd like to get involved and help cleaning. Because uh, as you see, we have a very large, beautiful facility. Uh, we just need uh, many hands to make for light work. So if you can help be a part of that, I would graciously, graciously thank you. Uh, so if you look at your Bibles this morning at John chapter 3, I thank you, Brother Ron, for reading the word this morning. If you notice on the board, the title of it is Let Us Believe. Believe. What do we believe in and why we believe it? This morning, before I begin reading, I'd like to take a moment and just pray, and I'd ask you to pray with me. Because we, as children of God, are those who believe. And the understanding of belief and why it is and how it is and how it changes your life is the application of how we have the opportunity to go in the world and make a difference. And as we think about Christmas, I hope that Christmas is not about the tree or the gifts, but I hope it's about Jesus, the Son of God, who came to this earth to die for you and I so that we would no longer be bound by sin but have the freedom and the liberty to serve the greatest King of Kings. So this morning as I pray, I hope that you pray with me and ask God to meet with us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for Red Lion Faith Chapel. I thank you for the faithfulness of your people. I thank you for the visitors that have been here every week. Father, I pray that you just continue to move mountains. Lord, I pray that you help us and allow us to have the faith to move mountains. And Lord, to continue to strive and to work and to please you. Father, I pray for laborers. I pray for the nursery right now this very moment. Lord, all those children back there, I praise you for those children. They are the next generation and the generations to come that may be able to worship you and to be in this facility to, to pray and to sing and to read your word. God, I'm asking you this morning to do something that I can't. Lord, you know I can't do this myself. God, I need you. Father, I need you to move in the hearts and the minds of the people, your people. God, I thank you for this position. I thank you for allowing me to stand here, but God, you know I don't deserve it. Father, I pray back, I pray that you peel back the layers of people's hearts and allow them to see the true and the living God, the Savior, the one who's still on the throne, saving still today. God, I pray you just hide me behind the cross. Speak through me in only ways that you can. I pray now that you just go down every aisle and touch every heart and open every ear. Father, help us to believe, help us to trust, and help us to obey. We need you, O oh God, in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, before I begin reading, I'd like to actually try to sing you a song. It's kind of, I loved how the Lord worked that out, because God put this on my heart, and it's one of my favorite songs. If you ever see me around the building or hear me, I'm probably usually singing something. Because the Bible says that God puts a song in your heart. This song is called Little Is Much When God Is In It. I'm not sure if you've ever heard it or not, but it's something that means so much to me. And I'm gonna, here we go, we're going to try it. In the harvest field now ripen. There's a work for all to do. Hark, the voice of God is calling to a harvest calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. 
If you go in Jesus' name, does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is of the Lord Jesus, and he'll not forsake his own. Little is much when God is in it, labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And when the conflict now is ended and our race on earth is done, he will say to all the faithful, welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. I sing you that song this morning because my heart is broken. I sing you that song because I see the world and how the world influences Christians more today than what the Word of God does. I sing you that song this morning because as we open the Word of God and as we see, if you have a red letter Bible, these are the the words of Jesus. We have to understand what faith is and what believing is. So in chapter 3 and verse number 1, the Bible says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou hast done except God be with him. Aren't you glad this morning that we can have God with us? There is no separation. We have the, we have the authority and the belief to see and touch and know Almighty God. This morning when you look at the word Nicodemus, he was a Pharisee. And if you've studied the Word of God and you understand what a Pharisee is, this was a man of the Jews who at the highest calling knew all that he could about the walks of Jewish life. Now, I want you to think about this. Because Nicodemus, right, in verse number one, it tells about who he is and how he has a little bit of power. But I want you to look at verse number two because this is the thing that stuck out the most to me. It says, the same came to Jesus by night. Why do you think he came to him by night? Because he was so worried about what other people were going to think about him. A Pharisee, a man who was claimed to know all, now coming to Lord Jesus Christ at night to say, now listen, you have to be of God. Has God ever answered prayer in your life? Has God moved mountains in your life? Has God saved your wretched soul this morning? Because it starts at the belief of salvation, knowing that we cannot save ourselves. We are a sinful nature people, born into sin, and we're going to die in sin. The greatest thing is we have a Savior who has stretched forth his right hand of righteousness, the Bible says, and pulled us out of the fiery flame that we don't have to be or be afraid of going to a place called hell. This morning, can I ask you, are you truly saved? Are you biblically saved? I will never question anyone's salvation. That's between you and God. But I will ask you, are you truly saved? Because salvation is simple. Salvation is asking, the Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And what that means is I'm calling out, help me, God. Please save my wretched soul. I realize and I recognize that I am a sinner. That there's nothing that I can do nor money that I can pay to get to heaven. But it's simply by the blood of Jesus. Believing in your heart that he is the son of God. Asking the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Come into my life and to help me. To show me your power. To show me your might. Thank you for grace. It's believing. Today if you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. I need your help. I need your help to believe that God is going to resurrect this church. And he's going to use it in only ways that he can. There are so many folks here today that says, Brother Zach, I can't do much, which I completely, 100% understand. But what I need you to do is stop right now and start praying. 
I need you to pray that God will build this church. I need you to pray that God will move amongst the people in this church. I need you to pray that God will bring laborers. I need you to pray that God will rejuvenate, regenerate, and build his church. Do you want to be a part of that? I do. Because I've already seen God moving. We started Sunday school with three people. This morning we had 12. We started Wednesday nights with three people. We're up to 10. This morning, we need to get on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ because if we believe in Him for salvation, we need to believe that He will build His church. We need to believe that He is going to continue to do the work that He has said He was going to do. How many of you have ever told a promise and never kept it? Come on. But you know, the greatest thing is Jesus will never not keep a promise. Jesus has never lied to us. He will never lie to us. And he is the way, the truth, and the life that no man cometh the Father but by him. Nicodemus recognized that. He recognized in verse 1 and 2 that no way is this not the Son of God. Today, I hope the Son of God is in your life, that he's paid your sin debt. He's freed you from that bondage of sin. Because look at verse number 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now he's saying, listen, he's saying this to Nicodemus. Now let me just have your attention for a moment. Can you open your ears? Can you just stay awake just for a second? You cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven without being born again. That just means calling on the name of the Lord Jesus, confessing your sins, and begging God to come into your life and in your heart. That doesn't mean life's going to be easy. Amen? That doesn't mean you're not going to go through trials and tribulations and torment. It doesn't mean you're not going to go, what the Bible says, through the fire. But the greatest thing is you're never alone. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. It doesn't matter how big the storm is. It doesn't matter how deep you're sinking Jesus says, I will be there. If we have believed on him for salvation this morning, we have to believe and trust that this is his perfect plan. That no matter what you go through, he'll always be there. Nicodemus, he's crying out to God because Nicodemus thought he knew everything. How often do we think we know everything? Nicodemus thought he was the man of men, that he was the Pharisee. He was the man on the throne, but God showed him that there's nothing greater in this world than Jesus. In verse number four, Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can you think about that for a moment? Jesus is sitting there saying, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven unless you be born again. Now a Pharisee, the man who thinks he knows everything, begins to scratch his head thinking, I can't go back. There's no way I can go back into my mother's womb to be reborn, so how am I going to do this? Aren't you glad that Jesus simplifies things? In verse 5, Jesus says, right, Jesus answered, verily, verily, he's trying to get his attention again, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now he's saying, don't worry about your mom. Don't worry about where you came from. Let's get right with God today. Let your spirit get right with God. Because what the Bible says that when we die, right, that absent of the body to be in the presence of God. That means this body is wretched. It's wicked. The Bible talks about the flesh from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. We've got to stop worrying about pleasing the flesh and the things we desire and get on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. To let the Holy Spirit that's manifest in you if you're saved today to do the work of God. But what happens is the Bible says that we like to quench the Spirit. You guys ever seen a fire before? Isn't it pretty? It has like a red and a blue and an orange, like all these different colors inside that flame. But I remember once I went camping and I'm sitting there looking at this fire, and we're about to go to sleep, and all I realize is my wife is coming out with this big pitcher of water and pours it all over the flame. I'm like, what are you doing? I see you know how hard it's going to be to start that thing in the morning? Don't you want breakfast and hot coffee on that thing? Because the more we pour water on the Spirit of God, the harder it's going to be to regenerate it the next morning. The more you sin and live for sin and the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's going to be harder to get up the next morning. Amen? 
Do you understand? Are you picking up what I'm putting down today? Because the more we allow sin and the world into our life, the harder it's going to be to serve God. Because we're going to be enjoying the lust of the flesh, enjoying the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and the things that this world offers, and we're not going to be enjoying the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Get in the yoke with me, I will make your work light. This morning, I was on the way to to church, and I shared this with Sunday school, because I almost started crying. If y'all can't tell, I'm emotional. You know what's interesting about that? I used to be the most hard-hearted, angry, mad all the time. Chip on my shoulder. You can't touch me, I'll knock your teeth out. I never cried for years and years and years. Because I was so bitter and I was so mad and I just hated life. And then I met Jesus. And he took that hardness. It's like he just grabbed my heart and just started squeezing. Have you ever ringed out a towel before? <sighs> this morning on the way here, our daughter Rachel, she's with me and Andrew and Lily are in the back. And I got to share this with you. I try not to share the same thing I do in Sunday school. But I got to share this with you. We're driving here and I, I looked over and you may have seen her boyfriend Dylan. He's came a couple times. He lives about five minutes down the road. And I said, hey, is Dylan coming to church this morning? She's like, No. I said, what, did that make him mad? Did that scare him? Like, most people say I'm intimidating. What happened? She's like, that's not it at all. I don't think I should tell you. And I said, you could tell me anything. You knew that. Whew. She says mom and dad make fun of him for coming to church. They're atheists. They don't believe. Because of his mom and dad making fun of him and laughing at him, he's not going to come to church to hear the precious word of God. The word of God that will change his life, that he could go to his mom and dad and share the gospel. I understand the, the, the impact of having a mom or dad, but understanding how good and great the gospel is. The belief of salvation, knowing that it and only it can change you. Can I tell you this morning, I can't change you. I can't change anything about you, but what I can do is pray for every single person here today, every single person that walks in that door walks out of that door, because the power of prayer will move mountains. Can I ask you this morning to pray? Pray for him, pray for his family. They live five minutes down the road, and the craziest part about it, that plumbing business over there, his dad rents that parking lot and parks all of his tow trucks there. He knows that this building is here. He knew exactly where he was coming to church, but he made fun of him because he had the desire to come to church. Could you imagine that today? That's the world we live in, that people mock those who go to church. Aren't you glad we have Jesus? That we don't have to worry about the things that are going on in this world. Jesus said, if you're not being persecuted, you're probably not doing the right thing anyways. When is the last time the world made fun of you or mocked you or spit at you or did anything to offend you because you said that you were a Christian and you served Almighty God? That's the difference. We have to understand that salvation is not just believing and asking God to save you, but it's living for the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'll show you why. In verse number 6, it says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's that sin. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, here's the thing. If you like to underline, circle, put box around, that word in the verse number seven, marvel. I'm not talking about comics here, folks. It says, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. He said, now listen, stop trying to ponder it. Stop trying to think about it. You're not going to figure it out. But believe by faith that the Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings. The Lord of Lords, the I Am, the Jehovah Jireh, the Yahweh, and all that He is, and He's going to do it all for you. How often do we try to figure things out? We don't have to, and I'm going to show you why. Proverbs 3 and verse 8, the Bible says this, Salvation belongeth unto the Lord, thy blessings is upon thy people, Selah. Salvation belongs to God. We can't save ourselves. We have to trust and believe, because Acts 28, 28, Be it known, therefore, unto you, that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, that's you and I, that they will hear it. The Bible says that faith 
starts in the Word. The Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word is true and indeed, and it has proven itself from generation to generation to generation and generations to come. The sad part is, and I'm just going to be honest with you this morning, and I hope I don't offend you, and if I do, I'm sorry. This doesn't need to be rewritten. It's the truth. There is no error. If you go back to the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it is true and it will prevail in your life if it has the right place in your life. This is not a bookend, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a bookend. This is not something that you leave on the dash of your car. This is something that you hold in true. This is your sword and this is how you defeat the enemy. Can I ask you this morning, where is the word of God at in your life? What application are you seeking and begging God to do and to add to your life? Because I want to share something with you. Look at verse number seven, excuse me, verse number eight. It says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot not tell whence it cometh. And though whither it, it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Can you see the wind? Can anybody, can anybody see the wind? If you can, let me know, because that'd be pretty cool to see. But you can hear it, right? We don't know where it comes from. We don't know where it's going. We don't, we've never seen God. I can't wait to see him. But we can hear the word of God. The application, knowing that it's true, that we're going to walk by faith and not by sight, trusting in him and not of ourselves, nor this nasty, wicked world. Can I ask you this morning, has the world ever done anything good for you? Has the world ever done anything good for you? The world has given me pain, sorrow, Heartache, tears, suffering, complaining, murmuring, mocking. I mean, the list could go as probably as tall as Mount Everest. Because that's what the world does. But aren't you glad what Jesus has done? D-O-N-E. He did it for you and I so that we don't have to. Whew. I get excited, can you tell? Am I going slow enough? Verse number 9 says, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? If we're honest with us, each other this morning, how often do we question God? Question God? Why, God? Why are these things happening? Where are you? What's going on? Why am I going through this? I want you to write this down. I had the Sunday school write down this morning, but I want to share it with you. A faith unchallenged is a faith unchanged. A faith unchallenged is a faith unchanged. Do you know why God allows us to go through trials and tribulations and the things of this earth? It's to show us how mighty and how great and how good and how precious and how merciful our Lord Jesus Christ is. Aren't you glad for that this morning? Without God, we would be nothing. Without God, we would be on our way to hell. Without God sending his only son, Jesus, to die on this earth to give us separation of ourselves and of our sin, he did it because he loved us. Because he loved us. Romans 6, 14, the Bible says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Aren't you glad for grace? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Nicodemus is sitting here thinking, man, I am the man. I know it all. I've been there. I've done that. I've got the t-shirt to prove it. But now he's scratching his head wondering what in the world is going on. To see miracles, to see the blind, to give sight, to see the lame and to get up and walk. Think about this. Those three men, when they saw that house full of people, they said, we're not going to worry about these people. We're going to climb up on the roof. We're going to peel back the shingles. And we're going to lower this man down in there because he needs to be healed. Who are you surrounding yourselves by? Who are your friends? Are they pointing you to Christ? Or are they dragging you out somewhere else? Are they inviting you to church? Are you inviting them to church? Or are they trying to get you to go hang out and do something else? Because the people you need to surround yourself with are godly people. Those people are going to pray for you. They're going to lift you up. They're going to point you. They're going to edify you. They're going to show you by the grace of God that godly people can stand together in the gap to make a difference. Are you hearing me this morning? We have to surround ourselves by godly people 
We as Christians need to be the godly example because this here Jesus was showing Nicodemus how great and how merciful and how powerful he was by taking the lame and giving them legs and being able to walk and to do, taking the blind and giving them sight. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He's the same God that saved your wretched soul if you're saved today. And he's the same God that's going to come back on the white horse the day of judgment when the trumpet shall, shall, shall sound and time shall be no more. The Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Are you with me? Are you excited? Not only do we have to have the belief of salvation, but I want you to look at verse number 10 because Nicodemus is scratching his head. How can this be? In verse number 10, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou the master of Israel? Now he's questioning Nicodemus. Well, I thought you knew everything. I thought you knew what was real and what was not. And knowest of these things. Jesus says to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and received not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? He's sitting there saying to Nicodemus, how in this world, if you don't believe what am I saying, but I show you the things that I can do and you don't believe, how are you going to believe in heavenly things? Belief starts in the Lord Jesus. Knowing that he is evident, it is clear. If you look all through back in time, do you know even our calendar is written around the birth and the death of Jesus? Back then it used to be A.D., excuse me, B.C. and A.D. You know they've tried to change that like five times now? Because they want to take everything they can out of the sight of God. Could you imagine what this world would be like if we actually had Bible back in the schools? Could you imagine what this world would be like if we had the Ten Commandments back in the schools, on the walls, that people realize that He is God and not the people of this world? Now, I'm going to say this, and if I offend you, I'm sorry, but this is real, and I hope it's on that camera so all the world can see it. There should not be men dressing up as women teaching our children. I'm going to say it one more time. There should never be a man dressing up as a woman to teach our children. We have the greatest example. His name is Jesus. If you teach them about God and who he is and what he's done, this world would be no problem. But what happens is people in this world want to take God out of it and put everything they can in it. What we as Christians have to do is take the idols out of our lives and put God first. Because if we let God do and be who God is, everything else is going to work out just fine. I get stirred up about that. Colossians 2 6, the Bible says this. As ye I gotta calm down. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so ye walk in him. Walk. Do the walk and do the talk. Because everything we do and everything we say, guess what? Now people just want to record you, don't they? Everything you do and everything you say, people want to use against you in the name of the court and not the name of the Lord Jesus. But if we as people stand together in the gap and we hold ourselves accountable, we don't have to be afraid of what the world's going to judge us for. Can I be real with you? If we could just stop caring about what other people think about us, we would live a whole different life. Can I say that one more time? If we could just stop worrying and caring about what other people thought of us and just live for God, believing in faith that his plan is perfect, think about what your life would be like. But we get so consumed and worried about what other people think, what about the world think, what about this, what about that. Forget it. Because one day all these things are going to be gone. The new heaven and the new earth will be proclaimed. The king of kings will still be on the throne, but where are you going to be? Those same people that you're worried about, give them the gospel. The same people that you're worried about, show them, invite them to church. Show them where the church is. Hey, I go to church every year. I'd love for you to come. Stop caring about what people think. Care about what God thinks. Amen? He's the one that should matter, not the people of this earth. Because we are created when you're saved in God's image. That means what people see should be holy of holies. Living above reproach, the Bible says. Reproach means that people can't question you about what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. Because that means you should be doing right in the glory and honor of God. You guys hearing me today? 
Because it's not just believing for salvation of faith. It's trusting in his perfect plan. Because here Nicodemus and Jesus is telling him in verse number 12. If I told you earthly things you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? In Deuteronomy 5.33 the Bible says. Ye shall walk in all thy way which the Lord God hath commanded you. That ye may live and that it may be well with you. That ye may prolong your days in the land which ye shall possess. Think about that. God just says be faithful. Love people. Go out of your way. Stretch forth your hand. Pull them out of the fire. Show them the mighty and powerfulness of God. And isn't it amazing that God wants to use you and I, sinful people, to accomplish his perfect will. In Micah 6, 8, the Bible says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doeth the Lord require thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. If we could just love people and be humble and know that God's doing it for us, that we don't deserve it, God's going to move mountains, the church is going to be built, but I need your help. I need you to beg God to move. I need you to beg God to build this church. I need you to beg God that he's going to bring the people. We need laborers because, listen, if you walk outside these doors and you walk out here in the parking lot, you get in your car and you drive either direction, you're going to drive by people's homes who need God. You're going to drive by people's homes who are broken and are needing the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to drive by people's homes that were just like me, who were hard-hearted and rejected God and said there was no God. But then God says, here am I. Look at what I can do if you believe and trust in the name of the Lord Jesus. I promise you, if you put God first in your life, he will take care of the rest. Can you prove me wrong? I want you to try it. Put God first in your life and let him take care of the rest. And if he doesn't, come back and tell me. And I'll make a public confession that I was wrong. Try it. Do you know my favorite, most favorite illustration? I love sweets. I've already used this probably once or twice. I can put the most mouth-watering, delicious, ooh, then that cake looks so good. If I put it in front of you, you're going to want to take a bite of it. That's why I tell people all the time about Jesus. Just try it and let him prove to you how great and merciful and good that he is. That doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. That doesn't mean you're going to get rich. That doesn't mean that you're not going to go through things or hard things or good things or bad things. But we have to trust him that his way is perfect. Because if we're trusting him enough for salvation, we have to trust him enough to build his church, to send labors. And I need people that are on fire and says, well, listen, I can't do much, but I can pray. Can you beg God right now? God, move in the hearts of the people. Build your church. Bring people in because I'm not worried about this world. I want to bring as many people to heaven with me as I can. Not to say what I did, but to shook at God and say, look what God did. God did this for you and I. I promise I'm almost done. Verse number 14. Excuse me, 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that cameth down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Could you imagine being the Lord Jesus, standing in front of the disciples, saying, now listen, the Comforter's coming. I'm not him, but the Comforter's coming, and he's going to take care of you. i got to go. Could you imagine watching Jesus Christ, the same one who's taught you for three years and taught you the right from the wrong, from the good and the bad. You saw miracles. You saw the things he did. Could could you imagine being with him and taking five loaves of fishes and a couple pieces of bread and feeding 5,000 people? Not only did he do it once in the Bible, but he did it twice. Could you imagine being the Israelites standing at the foot of the Red Sea and it parting back? Could you be there beside Joshua, seeing the Jordan River just peel back and you walk across on dry land? I mean, think about all that God has done in your life. And think about the people that are right now needing God more than ever. If you're not excited about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back, come see me after the service and we'll talk about it. Because I want to take the Bible and show you it's coming. It's coming. 
The Bible says, stop looking down and worry. Look to the author and finish of our faith. Because all good things come from heaven. Keep an ear out because the trumpet's going to sound and time shall be no more. It seems as though our government nowadays is quite funny to try to say that there's such thing as aliens. I think they're just trying to prepare the people. When God comes back and people start ascending to heaven, they're going to say, oh, it was aliens. Don't worry about them. God's coming back. God is coming near. But how close are you to God? How is your prayer life? The Bible says to pray without ceasing, to pray morning, noon, and night. How is your Bible reading life? Because your Bible reading life reflects how close you are to God in that relationship. How often do we come to church or how often do we make excuses? We come to church to be edified, to be instructed, to be taught, to be able to go out into this world and survive. How many of you want to survive? The greatest survival tool that you could ever have in a backpack or in a pouch or anything is the Word of God. Coming to church to survive, to be edified and to taught, to be rejuvenated, the Bible says, to go out there. Because in the New Testament, I can show you, they met every single day. In heaven, the Bible says that heaven's going to be like one day for all of eternity. And for that all of eternity, we're going to be praising and worshiping God. So what is our excuse today that we can't come to church? Because let me show you something really quickly. Verse number 14, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but hath eternal life. This is the verse of all verses. Are you ready? If you put like a big giant circle, arrows, highlight, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe on him shall not perish, but have ever lasting life. Aren't you glad for everlasting life? Even in death, you're born again. You're going to get a new body. How many people's bodies here today? Whew. Man, a new body, a new heaven, and a new earth where there is no pain, there is no sorrow, there is no cancer, there is no torment, there is no gnashing of teeth, but it's there to praise and glorify God, the one who gave his life for you and I. Are you believing today? Do you believe that God can build this church? Do you believe that God can bring in labors? Do you believe that you yourself can get involved and do more? Because I need you to. We need you to come with an open heart and open mind, even in something so little. I mean, tiny. Even if that's just wiping off the back of the, the, the pews. Because the Bible says that if you, as a Christian, are faithful in a few things, I will make you ruler of many things. Where's your faith at today? Let us believe together that God can do it because he is still on the throne. In John 17, 3, just a chapter over, a few chapters over. And this is eternal life, that they may know thee and only thee, true God, Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Can we believe together today? Can we confess our sins because he's faithful and just forgives our sins and come boldly before the throne of grace and God together asking God to move in our hearts and in our minds because I need your help. In John 5, 24, this same, just two chapters over, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent him hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but his path from death unto life. The moment you close your eyes here on earth, you'll be in the presence of Almighty God. And if you don't believe me, read Paul. When Paul was getting stoned, he says, I traveled through the third heavens, and I saw the things that I could not even speak of. And lastly this morning, verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be, what's that next word? Saved. Saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. The light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deed may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. 
What is our deeds going to be looking like? The day you stand before God, what is he going to say about your life? You can change directions right now. Each day is a gift from God. What are we going to do with that gift? And in closing, the Bible says this in Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I hope you're longing for heaven. I hope you're excited to get there. But while you're still here on earth, God has a, a plan for you to accomplish. And we as Christians and as a church have to decide, are we with him or against him? Are we drawing near to the light or are we rejecting the light? The choice is yours. And I hope together we can stand before God one day and say we chose him. Our Father, I thank you for the precious and mighty word of God. Lord, I pray as these words proceed out of my mouth this morning, please, Father, help them not to see me or hear me. Help them to know this is your word. This is your light. Father, that you're trying to shine amongst them and in them, Lord, that they may go into the world that is dark and be the light in the dark and dying world. I thank you for your word that never returns void. Father, please deliver us from ourselves. Help us to serve and please you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. As Ms. Shuggy makes her way up to the organ, I'd like to ask you just to take a moment. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, nobody looking around. Please, nobody looking around. Just bow your head and close your eyes. Can I ask you this morning, are you truly born again? Have you given God your life and have you asked God to save you? Can I ask you this morning, if you're excited to say that you're saved, would you mind just slipping your hand up so 